Yeah. That's a great story. Um, speaking of faith, you have exuded some a, a significant amount of faith be tackling the issue of hunger. Talk to us about, you know, what you're working on now, what you're what you see in the future, and and how can our listeners, you know, get more engaged in tackling world hunger? I have the audacity of hope, as uh, Obama's book says, but also the audacity of faith to believe that there is an end to hunger. And that comes from the book of Revelation, when there will be no more death, where every tear will be wiped away. But I don't have to wait till heaven. I am convinced that we can end hunger because we have enough food in the world to feed everybody right now. And we will, even when the population grows to 9 billion in 25 years or so. So how do we do that? I'll get to the domestic side, but right now I'm working on global hunger. Thanks to a vision by some faithful farmers in Northwest Ohio who said, we have food, they're hungry people, we got to get it to them. And so Vernon and Carol Sloan got some help from their neighbors and sent a load of uh, grain from Toledo on the Great Lakes to uh, Honduras and the Gulf of Mexico. And they realized how expensive it was to ship and how inefficient. So instead, they got together with a number of Christian relief and development organizations and founded the Foods Resource Bank, modeled after the Canadian Food Grains Bank, our sister to the north. But they realized that they needed to uh, stop getting the questions about, are you a food bank? Can I get food? Are you a bank? Can I get a loan? Uh, your, one of your previous guests uh, talked about blood water mission and said, well, we get folks all the time asking to donate blood. <laughs> nope. So we changed our name a few years ago to Growing Hope Globally, where hope is literally our middle name. And we are growing lasting solutions to hunger by having farmers and their churches and communities in the United States support farmers and their communities overseas. They do that not by sending food, but instead selling it as they normally would here. Corn or soybeans or wheat, apples, milk, beef, doesn't matter. We are very ecumenical and we're agnostic on whatever crop it is that they're growing. We have maple syrup, we have flowers. Those proceeds go through us to one of almost 50 programs overseas in two dozen countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America that are all implemented by our trusted partners, by Catholic Relief Services or Church World Service, Lutheran World Relief, World Renew, Mennonite Central Committee, groups like that that have long-standing partnerships and relationships in those countries. We just fund uh, food security, agricultural development, and nutrition programs. They might be doing health or education, great stuff, but we just provide funding for the ones that are going to help folks in those particular countries feed themselves. And that's different. In Cambodia, it might be mushrooms. In Zimbabwe, it might be sweet potatoes. In Guatemala, it's tomatoes and peppers. It just depends because they know what they need. We just help provide the tools and training that they need to get there. It's a great example of local-led, <clears throat> you know, really not saying, oh, we think this is the problem. Let's go put a one-size-fits-all well, solution. It, it follows the model of, of what you referenced before, that, that Bloodwater finally had to pivot to understand that partnering with the local communities and the people who understand what's happening the best is better than the, taking just a broad brush to the, to the issue. I worked for, many, for a number of years with the United Nations World Food Program, the Nobel Prize winning largest humanitarian agency in the world. Yeah. They feed about 100 million people. That's great. But I, even after working there in the headquarters, had trouble wrapping my hands around that. <laughs> Growing hope globally. Don't tell David Beasley small, that. <laughs> is small. We're relational. Yeah. So 
what's great about that is the my board chair, who's a retired banker from rural northern Illinois who used to lend to farmers, he and his wife went to visit one of the programs they helped to support in Kenya, touched their lives, open their eyes, change them. We've done that for years where folks, regular church going folks in middle America in the heartland have their perspectives changed because of what they see happening. And we've brought folks from all over the world to come and speak here and share the stories of impact that make a difference. So uh, I'll give you one and then go from there. The uh, We hosted a, a woman from Cambodia, Pia. Mm. She works with World Hope International, the Wesleyan Relief and Development Organization, and they train farmers in Cambodia to grow mushrooms in dark houses, not greenhouses. And they provide the training. They talk about what's required in terms of the the temperatures and what you need to do to promote the conditions for optimal mushroom growth. Mushrooms are fast growing. They have a growing cycle of about 21 days. So you get a paycheck every month. That meant that the husbands of these subsistence rice farmers who had to take a job in the city with a factory could come home because their wives had become agricultural entrepreneurs. Mm. And now, you know, once a month, they're getting up at two in the morning, harvesting their mushrooms, getting it on the van uh, at four in the morning that's going to the wholesale market at six and it's in your soup for lunch and they're getting clean water. They're able to send their kids to school or pay the doctor bill because they're making money that provides for their families. And that has happened over and over and over again with our uh, agricultural development programs all over the world. That's a great testimony to people's faith, people's generosity, people's response to, uh, to Christ's call to whom much is given, much is required. Every single one of us in the United States have been blessed by winning the ovarian lottery. <laughs> we were born yeah. here. And we've that talked means, about that on the show. Yes. And we, we, and still our kids with that understanding as well. They Tried won the lottery. <laughs> yeah. And it's hard. I got a seven, almost 17 year old daughter and a 13 year old son, and they don't know what hunger is like. Mm -hmm. Okay. They might've skipped a meal once or twice, but they're not starving. And it's tough to remind them that they can't say I'm starving dad. Cause it's not true. Your kids the same way. We have, people who are hungry in the United States, but we no longer have famine or starvation. Right. We used to, and that changed thanks to government uh, intervention and programs that had bipartisan support from George McGovern and Bob Dole, for example. Uh, may they both rest in peace. Uh, folks who came together, Tony Hall and uh, Bill Emerson, the Republican from Missouri, and still that way today. So, that's that's great. And again, we have needs here in the United States, but nothing like the uh, on the brink of dying because we don't have enough to eat that happens overseas. Yeah, 